Okay, so we are filling up pretty quickly. We're about halfway there in, in so far as people that have registered, um, but we'll just kind of get going here. Uh, this is being recorded and will be available afterwards, um, posted on our website along with our other webinars. So hi everyone, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, I am your host, Luke Holcomb. First, I would like to give a brief intro about myself and Scott Laboratories. I've been working for Scott Labs since 2015, supporting the greater Midwest and Southwest with technical sales support. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in enology from Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. My background is large scale commercial winemaking and I started that in 2005. Most of the wines uh, I've made have been destined for distribution. So with that, the margin for error, especially during packaging is quite small. After putting nearly a million cases under wine, uh, of wine under screw cap, I've been lucky to have learned how to use screw caps properly um, with the guidance of folks like Eric. Uh, Scott Labs has been a leading vendor to the adult beverage production industry for over 80 years. We're based in Petaluma, California, and we strive to bring the best products to market with unparalleled support. Our portfolio ranges from crush pad equipment, biologicals, enological tools, and oak adjuncts filtration media and equipment, beverage integrity solutions, and what we consider to be best in class corks, screw caps, crown caps, bedules, wire hoods, and tin capsules. The purpose of this webinar is to present a broad overview of what proper implementation and sustainment looks like when using screw caps. We support many different types of closures and are not seeking to elevate or denigrate one over another. This is simply informative. Beverage packaging exists at the nexus of the components used. And regardless of the closure chosen, there are specific critical control points that must be understood to ensure component compatibility and bottling day success. And this is true for any closure. During this presentation, we will discuss proper application, bottling day quality control, winemaking considerations, and attempt to address common myths and misconceptions about using screw caps for wine packaging. While we will highlight some of the problems that can occur, we will also present remediation. All of this is with the intent to provide the end user with practical, applicable information. Knowledge is truly power. At this point, I'd like to introduce our guests. First, Amanda Fleming. Amanda is the head winemaker at Post Winery in Altus, Arkansas. Her, in her role, she leads the production of over 100,000 cases of still and sparkling wine for Zante's and hot filled juice products, mostly under screw cap. She's been in winemaking since 2008, doing so on the North Coast of California, Marlboro, New Zealand, and most recently here in Arkansas. She's a fermentation science graduate student at the University of Arkansas and is currently preparing for the upcoming harvest. I wanna thank her in advance for her time and convey our appreciation of her for sharing her expertise with us today. Thanks for having me guys. Awesome. Our next guest is Eric Graham, field technical expert for Amcor Capsules North America. Eric started his career in the wine industry in 2000, overseeing the packaging of more than 4 million cases of wine annually. In 2009, he worked in a similar capacity, supervising a mobile bottling line, working with approximately 45 different winery customers. In 2010, he was recruited by Amcor into the field technical service role for North America, where he has supported nearly 1,500 customers troubleshooting screw cap, glass, and capper setup issues. He's without a doubt the preeminent screw cap application expert in North America. Erica, I'm sorry, Eric, thank you for taking time today to share your vast experience with us. Thank you, Luke, and welcome everyone. All right. Uh, without further ado, let's uh, dive right in. This is where we've got most people on here. Fantastic. Um, Okay, so yeah, Scott Labs screw cap webinar, July 2020, how not to shrewd it up. Um, so there's my contact information and also contact information for Scott Laboratories. This will be revisited at the end of the presentation uh, if you need, don't capture it right now. So screw caps, how not to shrewd it up. Uh, if you are a fan of The Office, you remember this episode. Uh, so as I said before, practical presentation on screw cap application, bottling day QC, and uh, winemaking considerations, and we're going to address common myths and misconceptions. 
So this is what we don't want to have happen. And Eric, uh, what are we seeing there? Uh, we are seeing a very shrewded up cap. No, that's a, <laughs> that's, that's a train wreck. Um, yeah. It looks to me like somebody uh, had a, a spinner, uh, a cap that would not open. So they got a, a knife and proceeded to cut the cap from the model, which is never a good thing. And that person was... Okay, so real quick, I'm gonna throw up uh, the screw cap triage list. This is not an exhaustive list. It is not uh, in order of importance necessarily. Um, this is available, um, I can send it to you and I have hyperlinks in it, uh, goes to the individual products and all that kind of thing. We're not gonna delve deep into the tools necessary, uh, just gonna cover them generally and Amanda and Eric are gonna help. Um, and Eric, what is this called? That is taming the screw, but we refer to it as the Bible. Yes. Uh, it's a very, very great reference. Yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I have mine right here. So, and I'm sure uh, Amanda and Eric have theirs within close reach. So, myths and misconceptions. Uh, screw caps are only used for value-priced wine. Um, I don't believe that. I think that is uh, a scary story that we tell ourselves in the industry that all the consumers are, think that it, it just means cheap wine. And I think that is changing uh, nowadays, slowly but surely. Um, also, that screw caps cause reduction. We had a question about that earlier, and we're going to dive into that a little bit more. Uh, but it's kind of a topic for, for another day, uh, but we'll try to address it very generally. Um, all screw caps are the same, perform the same, and apply the same. Uh, Amanda, has that been your experience? No, not at Eric. all. <laughs> Eric? No, there's definitely some known differences from manufacturer to manufacturer. Even though they're intended to work with the same, on the same bottle finish, um, there are definitely some differences between manufacturer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's been my experience as well. So consumers don't like screw caps. Uh, Amanda, has that been the feedback that you've gotten? No, I mean, they're super convenient and mm -hmm. more and more people are moving to screw caps, uh, those who consume. Um, it's just easy and the wines are good. Right. Um, you know, and I think the really the, one of the purposes of this uh, webinar is to give everybody the tools and knowledge and the resources necessary to not only apply correctly, but kind of reach that convergence of uh, proper winemaking and proper application and, and marrying those two. So I want to throw this in here real quick. This is a topic that I'm very passionate about. And this, this actually kind of parlays into the reduction uh, discussion a little bit, but what you'll notice here is the difference in ullage, otherwise known as headspace, between a cork finish bottle and a screw cap finish bottle. So on the left hand side you have a cork finish bottle and the fill height is what it is, kind of notated there with that bracket. On the right hand side, uh, this is actually an overfilled bottle. Um, but it has a screw cap on it and you can note visually the difference with that, with that bracket. So with that, I wanna talk real quickly about math because it's important. Now, somewhere, I think I saw a couple science-y type folks on the attendee list and they may give me some grief about my lack of sig figs. And I'm fully aware of that, but that being said, uh, this, it, it, and this picture does not show W65 bottle. This looks like a, a burgundy type, but uh, you, I use W65 because it's one of the most common bottles out there. But I did some math yesterday, uh, really crunched some numbers, and the volume of ullage, uh, if you use the correct fill height at the correct temperature and all those variables, uh, it's about seven mils. When you have volume of a W65 screw cap finish, uh, it's like 19.71 mils. So that headspace increase is about 180%. Uh, 
Now, because they're in a really small package, 750 mils, that 180% has a drastic effect because you have a lot more surface area. Uh, but imagine this in a 180% value in a tank. That you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't not do anything about that as a wine maker, would you, Amanda? Oh, yeah, no, you'd definitely be doing something about that. <laughs> right. So, and we're going to show a little bit more about this in the future, but this headspace must be effectively managed in both bottles. Uh, in the cork, for example, most of the time this is handled by a vacuum corker. So that vacuum corker pulls a lot of that atmospheric air out um, and allows for a reduction in bottle shock. So Amanda, for example, and the folks at Post Winery, they have a liquid nitrogen dosing system, which we'll show you a video of here in a minute. And that uh, almost completely evacuates any of the atmospheric air and therefore the oxygen out of the headspace. Uh, and for more information on dissolved oxygen, we have a webinar already posted that I gave a couple weeks ago with Darren Michaels. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. And awesome. thank you, Amanda. And if you have anything to yes. give as an intro, take it away. All righty. So um, first of all, I wanted to thank Scott Labs for having me and thank you guys for all being here. Um, I am excited to be here. It's, I'm actually um, 38 weeks pregnant, so hopefully I won't be having to run to the hospital during this <laughs> webinar. So far, so good. Um, so that puts me due date August 5th, rookie mistake, right? Having a baby during harvest, but <laughs> sometimes these things happen. But anyways, uh, it's all good. Um, but I wanted to talk first a little bit about post-winery and who we are, what we do. Uh, as Luke said, uh, Post is located in Altus, Arkansas. And a little bit of background, it was established in 1880 uh, by a German settler named Jacob Post. And um, he began the tradition of winemaking and found out that growing grapes here actually works pretty well. So passing it down through five generations, here we are in 2020, and Post is still uh, making tons of wine today. They're the largest commercial winery in Arkansas. Um, the, the grapes that they're most well-known for growing and um, making into wine are muscadine, red and white, and that also is made into pasteurized juice that we sell on site. It's really delicious. Uh, I also have to give a shout out. We do produce um, some Labrusca grapes like Niagara. We also make Concord. And then a fun one that's unique to the Arkansas area. It's a French hybrid. It's called Enchantment. And that is a red grape and it's a uh, tinturier grape. So that means that the flesh is dark just like the skin. So it gives a super intense color. Um, and we love that. Uh, that was created by the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. And I believe that that was commercially released in 2017. So it's still kind of a baby, but um, has been relatively well accepted and a lot of good stuff coming from that. Um, so, but I will get on to what POST is all about when it comes to screw caps. And sure. Move on to the next slide. Hmm. Sometimes there's a little bit of a lag. I think there's a little bit of a lag on my end. Okay, I can move through the slides for you. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. So screw cap, as Luke said, is the dominant closure that we use at Post Winery about, you know, over 95% of post products are under screw cap closure. And we bottle nearly 270,000 gallons per year. So I came from mostly smaller winemaking background with a little bit of some larger production here and there. But so coming, so coming here to Arkansas was quite a shift in the amount of wine I was making and screw caps I was using. And over the course of the year, that I've been here, I've learned quite a bit. We bottle in 750s and 1.5 liter formats. We use screw caps for still and sparkling wines and also for the hot filled juice products. We like screw caps because the quality is good. 
There's a variety of aesthetics we can choose from and the price is right and consumers like it. So can't, uh, it's pretty much win-win. Um, quality control is of course really important as with anything during bottling of wine. So my lab crew, they'll, uh, before we actually start bottling, they'll check the free sulfur in the, uh, the bottling tank and we'll adjust free sulfur as necessary with regard to the pH, pretty standard. We'll also in the bottling tank, sparge the wine with nitrogen to, res to reduce the dissolved oxygen, I'll refer to it as DO. For reds, we uh, achieve uh, less than or you know, 0.8 milligram per liter. And then for whites and rosés, equal to or less than 0.5 milligram per liter because they're just more sensitive uh, wines. Just, they don't have that color for protection. And I would say really that when you're getting ready for bottling, um, aside from making sure that you have the right glass and the cap closure, you need to make sure that your free sulfur and DO standards are met prior to bottling so that your screw caps perform optimally and then your wine stays good under closure. Okay, so on the bottling line, in order to continue to ensure your optimal performance, so you've gone through the steps of pre-preparing pre or preparing for bottling. Now you are ready to go set up and you wanna double check that your, first of all, that your cap liners are intact and correct. Um, and so for pressured or sparkling wines, those screw caps actually have a different insert in them. It's like a, it looks like a plastic insert. And so those are, you have to use those with um, sparkling wines. And then for still wines, you have the Seratin or the Saranex liner, but you don't really want to use those for uh, sparkling wines. Um, for on our end, we uh, sparge empty bottles with nitrogen prior to filling. So we have a special counter pressure filler, very nice. Um, it's actually used for both, it can be used for both wine and beer, though we just use it for wine. So what happens in that process is this um, pressure filler will pull a vacuum from the bottle, fill it with nitrogen, repeat that process, and then fill with wine. So we're decreasing that, that uh, package oxygen as much as possible. Yeah, and I think that's a, a good time to point out something that generally speaking, brewers are much more concerned with oxygen pickup at, at all points during the process, but specifically during uh, filling compared to wineries because just very generally they have a higher pH, so they're not using SO2, they have lower alcohol. A lot of times there's live cultures packaged with it and they're relying on, on cold chain. So that oxygen pickup is just way more important for brewers. Um, I would argue that um, it should be important for winemakers as well to the same uh, level. But Amanda, real quick, um, do you think that your continued success in not having reduction under screw cap is due to your careful fermentation management and then fastidious oxygen management throughout the entire lifespan of the wine? Yeah, so fermentation is super important for starting that process of um, being able to manage reduction and oxidation, um, you know, choosing the right yeast for the grape, um, choosing the right temperature, making sure you don't have temperature spikes or uh, temperatures that dip too low and stress out your yeast. And then of course, having the, the right nutrient regimen according to the chemistry of your, of your grapes. So, you know, you can, really manage that reduction potential then. And then during the aging of the wine and tank or barrel, you're also managing your headspace, um, you know, sparging weekly um, and you know, making sure that when you do movements, anything like that, you're not getting too much oxygen or, um, so yeah, it's, it's really important that all of that happens prior to bottling. So I think of that as, um, preventative maintenance of your wine mm -hmm. instead of being reactionary where you're 
there on the line at bottling day and you're smelling your wine like, oh no, it's reduced. And I have done, you know, now I'm reacting to this problem and I can't really do much about it now. Um, so I wouldn't really say the screw caps are the issue there. <laughs> Right. And um, Eric, are there, I think there's quite a bit of information about that in uh, Taming the Screw. Is there not? There is. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. It, it, in the author's uh, opinion, he, there's a supplemental article of his that I read that um, his philosophy is prepare the wines correctly and you don't need to rely on the OTR or the oxygen transmission rate of the winer to, to get good wine. Um, his opinion it was more the liner choices are more of a crutch to poor wine making than um getting the wines right and sealing them tight with the sarin tin liner and then you get not only the the flavor profiles you want but you also get the shelf life that you might give up using a, a more permeable liner um you know and then obviously your your, uh, your shelf life is decreased because you're letting more oxygen in and then you've basically got to get through those wines much faster so you're giving right. up yeah, you know, that's been my experience as well. Same, same with Amanda. Like I put, you know, over a million cases under screw cap and it, very, very few circumstances have I ever seen reduction. And this is reds, rosés, whites, sparkling, all sorts of things. And it really gets back to uh, fermentation management and uh, oxygen management. But also, you know, if, if you, generally speaking, if you get a wine reductive, meaning um, low dissolved oxygen, and you hold it there in the cellar for a good period of time, um, most of the time those volatile sulfur compounds will exhibit themselves where they can then be mitigated and remediated. And if you do that correctly, when you put that wine in uh, any closure, crown cap, cork, screw cap, um, they won't reoccur later. So... Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, I think that's kind of about, about as much as we're going to talk about reduction. Um, also, I want to take this real quick minute. There was a raised hand. Um, if you could, I would really appreciate if you have a question, just type it in the question and answer uh, box, and we will answer it that uh, towards the end. Yeah. And there was a oh. question, Amanda. Yes. Yeah. Um, on what level of carbonation is used on the sparkling wines? And I know that depends. Uh, and also, is there a screw cap uh, selected uh, specifically for higher pressures? Hmm. Well, the, we do, so we do frizzante level, and then we do more of your regular like brute and spumante uh, level of carbonation. So that's anywhere from you know, 20, 2000 parts per million up to 4,000 parts per million. Um, and then as far as, uh, I don't, I think, you know, we just use the same pressure screw cap between both frizzante and, um, and our full on sparkling like brute. I don't know if you want to speak more to that, Eric. Yeah. Um, we do make, uh, a, a screw cap for a 30 by 60 screw cap for a wine bottle, like your typical wine bottle that is meant for higher pressures than normal still wine. Um, and I'll actually talk a little bit about on that in my piece, but basically we do have uh, liner options for specific circumstances like semi effervescent wines or even semi sparkling wines um, all the way up to about the 6,000 parts per million or six grams per liter or really six bar of pressure is the max. Right. Um, and Post was actually, as far as I know, the first winery in the United States to put sparkling level, like six bar uh, under screw cap in the United States. But um, anyway, so you can see, um, I'm going to start this short video, which uh, shows the liquid nitrogen uh, mm -hmm. that, that Amanda uses there at Post Winery. So we'll yep. play this here. And Amanda, do you want to describe? Yeah. I'll, I'll play it a couple times so people can see it. Yeah. So this is our parachute. It's a frizzante wine that is um, going to be going under screw cap. And in the picture to the, or the video to the left, it's actually receiving its inline nitrogen drip. So towards the very end where you see like that cloud coming up and the neck of the bottle. 
And so that's where Luke was talking about how we're diluting that oxygen and really um, mediating, lowering that headspace um, oxygen. Um, after that inline drip occurs, then that second video on your right, then it shows the caps going on. So we've got a four head capper, um, you move up along at a decent clip, and um, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Good. And um, this, you're using liquid nitrogen. Yeah, uh, using liquid nitrogen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Eric, uh, have you ever heard anybody using liquid argon by chance? Um, not, not very often. I actually, when I was at Laird, I had one customer that used liquid argon um, out of 45. Yeah, yeah, I've never, yeah, I've never seen that. Yeah. Just I don't know if, if everybody understands, but just very briefly, one of the interesting things about liquid nitrogen, when it, when it hits liquid, uh, it expands 700 times its volume from when it, when it transfers from liquid to gas. And so that, that change causes um, a, a lot of expansion in the headspace of the bottle. And that's what evacuates all that oxygen or, and all that uh, ambient air out of the headspace. That, that the only thing you have to be very conscious of with liquid nitrogen is um, managing the size of that dose so that there's time for that thermal or that expansion to finish before the screw cap is sealed onto the bottle or you're going to create a bomb. You, you, you know, you can create a whole lot of pressure under the cap that shouldn't be there. So there's definitely some, um, you know, training and, and some challenges to doing it and doing it correctly. But um, it's, it's an amazing amount of expansion just with a little tiny drip of, of liquid nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that, that dwell time and the, the amount of volume in, in, in the headspace, um, like you, you have control over that, right? On the, on the doser itself, like with different nozzles and different uh, uh, dose pressure or dose durations, correct? The duration, exactly. Yeah. And, and obviously um, the, the, the more high tech dosers you even have a, um, oh shoot, I just drew a blank on the name. Um, it's a thing that actually is tied to the, to the bottling line speed so that if the yeah. line speeds up or slows down, it will adjust that dwell time and the, and the target um, it, exactly. so that you end up with the same and encoder is what I was trying to think of. Um, and so that it, it will adjust on the fly. Um, on the more basic ones, you have to just do your homework. And in your tool list a couple slides ago, you, you mentioned having a, a needle and gauge or a piercer for typically used for checking vol uh, vacuum under a cork finish bottle. Uh, you can use that same tool, push it right down through the top of the screw cap after it's been applied and measure the amount of pressure in the headspace at, right. at the outlet of bottling. And Amanda's going to talk more about that. The other thing I've seen with uh, liquid nitrogen dosers is there's, a, I think, maybe one company that has a variable pitch feed screw for the bottles that is timed with the, the capper or the filler uh, to, to hit that specific amount of uh, internal pressure, which is super important, for example, in canning. But uh, let's yep. let's circle back um, and move on to the the next slide for Amanda here. Ooh, more QC, cool. So uh, what we do as well, I'll have my lab person uh, check every hour the following uh, for screw cap integrity. So we've got the torque measurements. And this machine that you see in the picture, this is the exact machine we have. So it just check, checks torque pressure. You insert the bottle on the base and then you'll um, start with removal torque, where, which is also called uh, skirt slip. And you're actually just slightly just opening up that, uh, that screw cap to where the skirt breaks free from the, the top of the screw cap. And so you're looking for specs, uh, pounds per inch between 7.9 and 16. And then you're going to check the bridge break. So where you're actually being, you're able to open the bottle or the screw cap and specs again are the same as removal torque. And then reverse torque is where you'll um, actually just, uh, you know, close that screw cap and um, strip out the thread. So you'll, uh, reverse, you go the opposite way um, with the screw cap and you want the pounds per inch to be at least four uh, values higher than the bridge break value. 
And then that ensures that uh, your screw cap is actually working properly and sealing and um, that really overall you have uh, good integrity of your screw cap. So we will, we'll check all heads. We have four heads. So we'll check all four heads every hour. Um, I mean, you might think it's time consuming, but not really. Uh, it's actually better than the alternative where you have, um, you go back and you find out that your screw caps aren't threading properly because you get a consumer complaint, but then you don't have the proper records to show which head or at what time these problems started occurring. We're also checking every hour the bottle pressure with the piercer gauge that Eric was talking about. So this piercer gauge you can use on cork, but it also works just fine with our screw caps. And for still wines, you're looking for a pressure in that, um, that ollage area of one to two PSI. This is at room temperature. And then for sparkling wines, uh, one to three PSI, again, at room temperature. Um, oxygen content is also crucial to check. So um, my lab crew will measure the dissolved oxygen and we've got our DO meter. This is actually a picture of our DO meter. A nifty little guy. So uh, as I mentioned before, we want our whites and rosés under uh, 0.5 ppm and our reds under 0.8 ppm. And then if you have the capability, you can check headspace oxygen with your piece of equipment and uh, total package oxygen, but I believe that that takes a little more of a complex piece of equipment. Uh, for us, checking DO every hour on a bottle or two is um, been sufficient and we haven't had really any oxidation issues. Um, our wines go to market, we you know pick them up a couple years later, I open it up off the shelf and it's still fresh and fruity um, and yeah, exactly what we want in our wines. So. Awesome, uh, one quick thing I wanna point out, um, the piercing gauge is sleeved, this particular piercing gauge, uh, for safety, uh, yep. but also for repeatability. So it, it tends to go in the same spot on the bottle every single time, which is with for any sort of analysis or quality control, the more repeatable you can be, the better, because uh, it's it'll, it'll yield more predictive, predictable results. Um, also, uh, one point to note on the uh, dissolved oxygen probe, um, if you don't have one and you're looking to buy one, uh, I always say to take a look at the size of the probe and whether or not it can actually fit down inside the bottle, the bottleneck. So that's. Yes. Ooh, okay. Aesthetics and messaging. So I love, I love the way screw caps look. I love that you can, you know, put all different sorts of designs on it and have all different sorts of colors, you know, going to unified, being able to see the screw cap vendors with their like rainbow array of colors is always really fun. I'm really big into <laughs> colors. So, um, but the, you know, aesthetics, as we know, all of that, it sends a message to the consumer. I think that these wines pictured here, uh, the red Moscato, the Moscato, the strawberry fields and the parachute, um, their design on the bottle, but also on the screw cap signifies fun. Um, light, fresh, fruity wines, they're all sparkling. So you can see that uh, like on one of the red caps, you can see the bubbles. Um, so it's, it's really fun that you can customize them that way. Uh, screw caps, as we know, really easy to open. You can take them to picnic, park, you know, out to the river. You don't have to worry about having a wine key. There's nothing more disheartening than you bring your, corked, your wine with a cork and you have no wine key. Um, I've been seeing more uh, single varietals and blends at higher price points that are under screw cap. And that's always really interesting to see that and taste those and uh, find out that they're quite good. Um, screw cap, I think, you know, as Luke had said in the past, there's been this myth that it can mean lower quality or it's only for value price, you know, economic wines, but that's simply not the case anymore. And it's easier than ever to find good quality for value under screw cap. And that's what the consumer is looking for, especially nowadays. Yeah, and so 
highlighting that the red cap on the strawberry fields, I think it's the easiest to see the artwork there. Um, you know, it kind of it shows the effervescent nature of, of the wine. Um, and then a little fun fact is if you remember the Scott socks from a couple years ago, which was uh, one of our best forays into the swag world, in my opinion, um, it was actually part of the stat screw cap was part of the aesthetic inspiration for our Scott socks. So <laughs> the world has gruity. <laughs> All right, so I'll go over some issues I've experienced with screw caps. And really these issues are because of just, you know, overlooked maintenance on the line. As long as your line is um, maintained consistently, your bottling equipment, you really shouldn't see these issues. Um, so one of them is a loose skirt um, and that signals an issue with your torque. And so you will immediately check individual capper heads. And Eric will, will talk more about this in detail. Um, I've also experienced missing threads. So where uh, the top of the screw cap goes on, you know, you really want like at least two full threads. And sometimes I've seen screw caps where there's only one full thread or like even like a partial threading. And so you're definitely gonna have leaking and uh, that's very time consuming to fix and costly. So you immediately want to check your capper parts for wear. And then this is an aesthetic issue, but it's the bird's beaking and it's caused by excess side pressure from the crimp rollers. And it just looks like, um, just like a little bird beak coming from the profile of the screw cap when it's actually on the, applied to the bottle. It just looks kind of funny, but I, I don't think it, it hurts the integrity of the seal. Um, so those really three are the just the big ones I've seen. Mm -hmm. And that about wraps it up on my end. I just wanted to point, well, I wanted to thank, first of all, uh, Amcor Flexibles and Scott Labs for helping with hosting this and all their knowledge. Um, and like they were talking about, Taming the Screw Cap is a great manual for referencing for understanding screw caps and um, the bottling line equipment that goes with it. Before I leave, I just wanna highlight that we have a picture on your left of post muscadine. We've got white, blush, and red. And on your right are muscadine grapes, which as you can see are quite different looking from Vitus vinifera um, and French hybrids. So. Uh, muscadine is really our bread and butter here, and it's a very unique grape. It's native to the south, and it does really well in the heat, does well with pests, um, and it's got a very unique flavor. It's really hard to describe, right, Luke? It's kind of more like when people ask you to describe it, you're like, well, it tastes like muscadine. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but, yes. But um, I would say the reds have very much of like a strawberry component, and then... Um, the whites are sometimes more like candied, um, like Jolly Rancher flavors. Um, but if you haven't tried any, please try some. It's a fun experience. <laughs> and I, I think if I had to interject there that uh, I would try the parachute. Um, it, it is unlike any wine you've ever experienced. I think it is one of the most unique wines uh, in, in, in the world. Um, and that's one of your flagship products, right? It is, yeah. So the parachute is it's white muscadine wine, and then it's sweetened back with muscadine juice, and then it's uh, brought up to a frizzante level of carbonation. So it's very refreshing. Um, you get some of those muscadine wine flavors, but then also that freshness and intense fruitiness from having the juice there. Right, awesome. Sounds delicious. It, it is. And, and for those uh, of us that live in the South, when it is uh, 100 degrees and 95% humidity, um, that's, that's my go-to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Uh, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Um, Luke, it looks like we're having the same control issue. I'm okay. attempting to uh, advance the slide and it's not working. Uh, I'll be your slide changer then. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
So I don't know how many people are familiar with the Stelvin name, but um, we tell people that Stelvin, when it comes to screw caps, that we're, we're, we are the Kleenex of screw caps. Um, it's the it's the brand name that people oftentimes refer to for the screw cap, especially used in the wine industry, and that is our brand name. Uh, it's Ampcore's brand name or their their trademark for their screw cap for for wine. Um, Today's goal is to just give a really brief overview of a few things, uh, challenges, um, things to pay attention to when using screw caps on your wine and um, trying very hard not to fall down that rabbit hole and take and make this presentation be way too long. So the point to, to go away with though is to know that um, there is expert help available uh, through Scott Labs or Amcor and that uh, it's nothing to fret about. These, these issues are rare um, when things are right and you've done all of your checks and all your pre-work, uh, the chance of th these things happening is very low. Uh, most of the time your bottlings are going to go very well and you're not going to run into these things, but, um, we're going to touch just briefly on kind of what causes some things and why there is sometimes a need to make adjustments to cure these issues. So one very nice thing about this type of screw capping or this type of closure is that it is a very visual application. And as long as you know those key points to be looking for, without even doing torque testing or any of the other stuff, basically just critically looking at the way the cap has been applied to the bottle, you can tell so much about your setup and application before you've even attempted to open the cap. And that makes it very nice and very easy to troubleshoot even remotely in these crazy times that we're living in. With a picture like this of the entire screw cap from top to bottom, I can tell you pretty much everything you need to know about the setup of your capper just from this one picture. Um, so then if you have an issue, those issues are also relatively easy to troubleshoot with some experience and with some repetition of seeing these things. Um, in the beginning for me, it took a while because you might go three or four months of bottling before you run into an issue. And by then you, you haven't had the reps to really remember what the proper attack plan of attack is. And so for me now, I tell people that I'm in an immersion program, but it's not a second language. It's screw cap. Um, I'm assisting so many customers almost daily that, um, you know, this, this stuff is just so second nature to me. It's, it's really to the point now where I feel like I've pretty much seen it all. So this picture here on the left, I'm going to cover some nomenclature, uh, but also point out a couple of things on this pic. So the very top of the bottle where it says top and redraw, you can see that there's kind of a, a ring formed into the top of the, of the screw cap. If you compare that to the same cap before it's been applied over in the top right corner of the screen, and compare that top corner, you can really see the difference pre and post application. What that redraw is doing is it's wrapping the liner around the outside radius of the top of the bottle, creating a top and side seal. Instead of just pushing flat down on the liner and compressing it against the top sealing surface, it's actually kind of getting pinched between that, that outside radius and that ring that's formed into the top of the cap. And what that does is that helps the liner control oxygen in and out of the bottle. Um, we're able to more closely mitigate oxygen getting in and out of the bottle, creates a nice tight seal. As the cap is being applied to the bottle, the way that the capping heads work is the capping head pushes down on the top of the bottle, creating that redraw and while the liner is held in compression, the cap is then formed around the threads that are already on the bottle. By forming good threads and capturing all the thread on the bottle, that's what holds that liner in compression and it's where your seal comes from. So as long as you have the proper amount of downward pressure and then a good thread formed, you're gonna have a good seal. All the stuff under and all these other de defects that we'll get into here in just a second, most of them have no effect on wine quality. They're either an aesthetic issue or, um, you know, just a, a mechanical issue that doesn't really affect the wine, which is great. I'm going to move on to the next slide. So very briefly, um, just so people understand, the 30 by 60 screw cap in a wine application is intended to go on the GPI 1680 finish bottle. 
And the nice thing about that, that finish is what happens is all the glass manufacturers, no matter where you're buying your glass from, have a standard to follow. That being said, the capping head is expecting certain critical def uh, certain critical dimensions of the bottle to be in a specific place on the bottle. So if those control points are out of spec, it may cause a, a, a need to adjust the capping heads to the position of those critical points because they're not where they belong. Um, when your glass is consistent and your heads are set up consistently and properly, the tolerance of these critical points moving up and down on the bottle or, or larger or smaller in diameter, those movements are small enough that the capping head can compensate and it doesn't typically require to make an adjustment. But if you have something kind of on the fringe and then you get bottle variation thrown into the, the mix, that's when you start to see cuts and, and other, other defect. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about here is the S dimension. Sorry. Yep. And if you see here on this, this is, a, this is a screenshot of the GPI spec for the 30 by 60. And you can see how detailed that is. Uh, takeaways here is that every dimension on the bottle has a letter assigned to it. The S dimension there is at the top. And it's the distance from the top of the thread start on the bottle to the top of the sealing surface. So that dictates where your threading rollers need to land on the bottle. So if you can see if that dimension is off, your threading rollers aren't going to be in the right place on the bottle and it can create an issue. Uh, next one. Animations. Animations, yep. <laughs> yeah, so you can see there uh, more of a zoomed in view of that from the same uh, screenshot. That's the estimation. And again, I already covered why it's important for it to be where it belongs. D dimension. So the, this is the dimension of the bottle that dictates where the tuck under or pilfer rollers need to land. So at the bottom of the D dimension, you can, uh, you can see where there's that little circle, dotted circle, there you go. So that's the ledge on the bottle that we're tucking under to lock the skirt of the screw cap to the bottle so that when you open it, the threads cause the top part of the cap to rise as you twist. And that's what puts the bridges in, in tension and eventually breaks them and leaves the skirt behind and separates the cap, causing um, the, all the bridges to break so that once that bottle has been open, your tamper evidency or pilfer proofing has now been um, voided and you know that that bottle has been opened. So again, if the D dimension is too big or too small, the tuck under rollers will have to be adjusted accordingly to end up landing in the right place on the bottle uh, because of, again, because of bottle variation. As long as the glass is staying within spec and your heads are set up nominally, the capping head can adjust for this so you're not having to adjust every single time you run or every single time you change uh, production date or batch of glass. Awesome. Re real quick, Eric, um, I've noticed that some people have a real hard time opening screw caps when they try to open the top of the, you know, grab the top of the screw cap. And then they also grab the skirt and try to separate them. And That's, isn't that like defeating the functionality of the cap? Yes. You're definitely fighting yourself at that point. So yeah. Um, yeah. real quickly, I'll, I'll add to that, Luke, cause it's, it's a good point. Um, I, we, I've had a couple customers in the last 10 years. Well, first call, first time I got the phone call was actually from a, a, a wine importer. And he said, you know, I'm very familiar with the Stelvin brand. I, I've opened thousands of bottles under screw cap, but bottles from this one particular customer that I'm importing are always very hard to open and I don't understand it. So I had him send me a picture and what this customer was doing was they were using a neck label and they, they were wrapping a neck label around the neck of the bottle, right at the, the end of the skirt and the, where the skirt of the screw cap meets the neck. So they're basically doing what you're saying. They're holding the skirt from being able to turn. And then to open the bottle, you're having to, to overcome the strength of that label to get things to start to move, which causes the bottle to be very hard to open. Um, yeah, the screw cap is one piece until those bridges break. So if you're holding the skirt and holding the cap, you're fighting yourself. Yeah. Um, a lot of people trying to fancy up the opening of a screw cap bottle will grab the entire bottle in one hand and then twist the punt into the bottle. You have more leverage because it's larger and it just looks fancier. Incidentally, that's how you uh, remove a sparkling cork as well. You, you, you torque exactly. on the bottom of the bottle, not on the cork itself. Exactly. Um, it's a leverage thing. Yeah. So we are, we're getting 
close on time. So let's, let's rock and roll here. Okay. So D angle will come up a lot um, because uh, D angle is one of the main causes of pull off. A pull off is when you go to open a bottle and the entire cap and skirt comes off in one piece. The skirt does not stay locked to the bottle. And if you look here in this zoomed in a uh, little bit to the right of screen, right under where it looks the, moving there, that bottle has a D angle that's well in excess of the 15 degree max. So no matter how well you apply that screw cap, when you go to open it, the cap is going to reform itself right up and over that ramp that is formed by the excessive D angle. And it's going to be impossible to open the bottle properly. Now, like I said earlier, the wine is still protected. Um, the threads are, are good. The downward pressure being applied to the top of the cap is good. So the wine is still going to be good. Okay. Next one. Uh, we talked about difficult opening the K dimension. A, a lot of people think that the screw cap finish ends where the tuck under happens, but it actually ends all the way down here at the K dimension. So the K is the diameter of the neck where the skirt meets the neck. If the dimension is too large, the, the screw cap it basically becomes press fit over the neck of the bottle and it makes a very hard opening bottle. And if it's too small, the bridges on the cap can actually break during application because the, the contact between the skirt and the neck gives the cap some stability while it's being applied. It uh, stops the bridges from breaking. So when the gap is too large and there's no st stability there, you're more likely to have broken bridges during application. Okay, next. You can click, click past that. There you go. Uh, we talked about liners earlier. Um, Saren X and Saren 10 are by far the most popular screw cap liner choices um, in the wine industry. Um, and those are offered by all of the screw cap manufacturers, not just Amcor. Uh, Saren X probably, they, they say more closely mimics an average grade cork, um, where Saren 10 is a tighter seal with less oxygen transmission rate or OTR. There are special use liners. We have liners for pressurized products up to six bar, and we have liners for pasteurized or hot filled products uh, that are meant to deal with the, those high temperatures that can be exhibited during those processes. Uh, really what we do is we encourage the, wine, uh, the, the users to do their homework and to do trials to determine which liner is best for them. But I would say probably 80% maybe close to 80% of the liners that we sell are Saren X, which is just kind of like the norm. It's the average. If you have a wine that's super sensitive to oxidation or, or a wine that's going to be cellared for a long time, Saren, uh, Saren Tin is the tighter version that would either allow those wines to keep longer or protect a, a more sensitive wine. This, this slide here just shows, um, sorry about that, Luke. Um, just shows, gives you a general idea of um, when you're checking OTR, oxygen tr transmission rate of all the different types of closures out there on the market, kind of where those things land in comparison to one another through many, many uh, different laboratory tests. Yep. Next. Hey, th uh, this slide here, uh, um, we're going to start getting into the, here we go, into the, uh, common defects. So pull off is probably the number one issue that people struggle with with screw cap. Uh, pull off again is when you go to open the cap and instead of separating the entire cap and skirt comes off the bottle, nothing stays behind. This does not affect wine quality or integrity. Um, there can be multiple causes of this. A lot of times it is that D angle on the bottle or the outside radius from the D angle, angle is too rounded off. So that doesn't leave you enough shelf to hold on to causing the cap to unlock from the bottle and come off. If the side pressure on your tuck under rollers is too low and they're not penetrating fully, creating a deep enough groove, that can also cause pull off. And if there's a cap manufacturing issue, if the bridges are not cut properly so that perforation isn't perforated fully around the cap, when you go to open the cap, that cap is going to be so resistant to coming apart that it's going to become a pull off. Now this kind of goes back to what Amanda touched on earlier with torque test results. When you're having a pull-off issue, it's very rare to have every single bottle pull off. So you, you look at your torque test data and determine whether your bridge brakes are abnormally high or low. If you have low bridge brake or normal, what I would say normal bridge brake, but you're having pull-off, the cap is not the problem. Um, then, then you go into adding side pressure until you either 
to pull off stops or until you start breaking bridges. And if you, if you have broken bridges, that's kind of like the opposite of pull off. One is saying, I have so much side pressure that the bridges are breaking because of the cap flexing. And the other is saying, I don't have enough side pressure because I'm having pull off. So yeah, at that point. Well, yeah, so, you, sorry, I, I was just going to interject there. You know, I've, I've seen this before um, with, variability in the molds of the glass where you know it's it's not a capper setup issue it's not a screw cap issue it is maybe a specific mold exactly you know so it, it, it sometimes the stuff to track down whether it's screw caps or corks or fill heights i mean i've even seen slug necks in uh, cork bottles that cause low fills yeah. um, it's it can be a mold issue that, that's a really good point luke so none of the glass manufacturers may intentionally make glass that's out of spec and when the yeah. When the runs start, they almost are, always are fully in spec. Uh, that bad D angle actually comes from dirty molds typically. As the molds get dirty, the graphite that they use to lubricate the mold starts to fill in the sharpest corners on the mold. And as that sharp corner from the neck to the D angle starts to get rounded off, that, that angle gets out of control. So that's typically what happens. And because they're manually swabbing most of these molds, all it takes is the guy swabbing to get overzealous one time um, to cause a mold number to go out of spec for several bottles. And they may not catch it in their QC process because it does kind of burn off and may actually recover slightly. Um, so when we, when we see a pull off issue, a lot of times we can track it back to cavity number. You're absolutely right. And or timestamp on the bottle. Yeah, and that that kind of gets into a, a, a conversation I, I yeah. don't want to have at this point. But Again. like, if you ever want to understand why there's variability in glass, call your glass supplier and arrange a trip uh, down to the um, absolutely the ma manufacturer. And I do want to say one thing real quick, yeah. uh, coming from the proactive winemaker side. Um, if you do have a new mold you're bringing in, I would suggest you know getting a couple samples of cases of the glass having your screw cap on hand and then just running that glass uh, as a dry run through your bottling equipment, making sure that you have all of the right um, equipment and, you know, don't do that the day before do that like a couple months before, if you can, or a few weeks Absolutely. before. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So we're going to try to pick up the pace. Yeah. A little yep. Bit. Yep. Spinners. So we mentioned that when uh, when Luke was showing the shrouded up cap at the very beginning. So a spinner is when you go to open the cap and the threads fail before the tuck under fails or before the bridges break. So now you have a cap that just spins and spins and spins on the bottle and will never open until you get out your knife and you completely yeah. cut the cap away from the bottle. Yeah. Spinners are a horrible thing to send send out in the market. And this is where the reverse or strip torque test that Amanda mentioned comes from. So if you're doing that torque test routinely, you're doing a visual inspection and you see that the bottle has a complete thread, a well-formed thread, and you do the reverse torque test and the reverse torque is significantly higher than your bridge break torque, then there's no reason that this bottle should ever become a spinner. Yeah. Um, as you open that bottle, the bridges get pulled on. If the bridge, bridge break is lower than bridge strength or the thread strength, they should always break before the threads strip out. So there's just no reason. Uh, for that to be a huge issue. And that is your safety net or your guarantee that the bottles that you're running are not going to become a spinner out in the market. And this is one where there's no issue with wine quality, but you're definitely going to hear about it from the consumer. Absolutely. Yes. is probably the, the, the one that people get the most bent out of shape about when a consumer can't get to their wine, they have to get a knife out to cut the screw cap off. Yeah. They get very upset and it, and, obviously they throw in the safety concern. You know, I almost stabbed myself while I was trying, attempting to pry this excessively heavy material off the top of the bottle, yada, yada. So yep. yeah, we don't want to go there. So there, there's a, there's a test for that. Right. Uh, broken bridges. Uh, so w uh, one thing that people don't commonly understand about screw capping is that a lot of the success of screw capping comes from the way the cap is being supported by the bottle inside it. So if your bottle is on the very small side, allowing the cap to flex a lot while, while it's being applied to the bottle, you're more likely to have issues like broken bridges. Um, so the only thing you can really do to reduce broken bridges is to reduce side pressure on your pilfer or tuck under rollers. 
but you're kind of in a box there too, because if you re reduce them too much, then you can create pull-offs. So it's one of those things um, you shouldn't have pull off and broken bridges at the same time because um, reducing the side pressure enough to cause pull off, you should not still have broken bridges. Another thing that can cause broken bridges in addition to excessive pressure is excessive tilt in the top of the bottle. So if you think about it, if the entire top of the bottle was tilted, the, the, the entire cap has to tilt with it, but the bottom of the skirt where it meets the neck is trapped. And so if you have excessive tilt in the very top of the bottle, you basically put a kink in the screw cap and that will pry the bridges open on one side and smash them closed on the other. So, so that's uh, a, a really good segue into something that, that we all, we three have talked about is picking the right bottle or, or a bottle that will give you the uh, least amount of issues is going to be like a really stable, wide bottom. low center gravity, um, uh, you know, like a, like a, a yep. Bordeaux, whereas, <laughs> A hawk, real tall, skinny, wobbly bottle is, is just going to be problematic or more problematic. Right. And it goes back to having the proper bottle handling parts also. And, yep. and uh, most of the screw cap manufacturers have a good control on that where they're actually adding a third level of a third tier of uh, bottle control to their bottle handling parts to, to grab the screw cap bottle up right below where the skirt meets instead of just grabbing by the label panel area. If you have a tall, reverse taper bottle and you're only grabbing by the label panel area and you're trying to run at high speed, there's a very good chance that you're going to end up having centering issues yeah. that can absolutely cause broken bridges and other uh, issues. So that's, that's packaging component compatibility that we talked about earlier. Um, yeah. But a lot of, you know, sometimes we don't have any choice, right? So marketing makes a decision right. and we got to run with it. So just, just know that like, if it is one of those highly unstable bottles, you know, and your, your bottling line is capable of running a hundred bottles a minute, you may be only be able to run 50. Yeah. Success. Do, do your homework. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So if, if, if you're having one of these issues and you slow down and the problem goes away, it's absolutely a bottle control issue. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I think that's the last one. Uh, this is another fairly common one cutting in the tuck under. So I mentioned earlier, and Amanda mentioned that when you, when you're doing your visual inspection of the screw cap, you should have two full turns of revolution in the threads, which means that the tuck under rollers also made two full turns around the, the bottle while they're, while they're forming that groove into the, into the skirt. So theoretically, even if one roller was too high, you should have a cut all the way around the cap, like, a, like on the cap on the right. But realistically, when we see cuts in the tuck under, they're more like the blue cap there where there's just a little maybe quarter inch long cut and it's not every time, it's random. Fortunately, the fix is still the same. Um, so the height of the tuck under rollers has to be low enough for the aluminum material to tuck under that ledge on the D angle on the bottle being pushed in by the tip of the tuck under roller, but without getting pinched or, or uh, you basically have the same effect as like a pair of scissors or shears work. If, they, if there's not room for the aluminum to pass between those two hard points, it's going to cut. So, um, the fix is to lower the tuck under roller slightly just until there's enough room for that aluminum to tuck through that gap without getting pinched. The severity and the frequency of that cut is gonna be your guide on how big of an adjustment to make. So the blue cap on the left, you might only go down um, a 12th of a turn, just a tiny amount right. on both tuck under rollers. The one on the right, you may have to go down a quarter turn, gotcha. maybe even a half turn. Um, so again, make small adjustments, equal adjustments, until the problem goes away and a uh, pretty easy fix. So again, I mentioned it's a very visual application. Um, I'm going to recap a little bit. So if you start at the top of the cap and work your way down, you see the redraw at the top. There's that nice ring formed into the top of the cap. That's telling you that the bottle is centered, that you have the right amount of top load pressure pushing down on the cap. Um, the bottle was centered under the capping head. You go down into the threading area. You can see the thread start of the bottle showing up through the threads on the bottle. And if you go from there and you trace that thread around the bottle down to the end, that's exactly two turns of thread. So that even tells me that the machine height was correct um, because if the machine height was too high, you'd have a short thread. If it was too low, you'd have, to, you'd have excessive thread. Um, 
You look at the bridges, none of the bridges are broken. There's no puckering of the material between the bridges. They're not torqued over or on the verge of breaking. Everything looks nice and clean. You move down to the tuck under groove. The groove is full depth. It's nice and uniform. You see like almost like a, a V shape or like the Pac-Man mouth um, shape, um, which tells me that the tuck under roller, roller height is correct. And then that, that male bead that Luke's pointing at right now with the pointer, this is where a bird beak would occur. Amanda, Amanda pointed those. And now I regret not having a picture of a bird beak in the presentation. But basically what it is, it's like a puckering of the material in that, in that support bead. And what causes that, again, is excessive pressure causing the cap to flex too much. You basically start pushing a wave of material around the cap. And when those rollers release, it leaves that puckering of material. What does it, what does it generally look like? Like a bird beak. Okay, okay, just checking. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's just an outward pecker, <laughs> uh, just a pucker, a pucker of material. Just absolutely a, uh, aesthetic issue, not uh, nothing to worry about. Right. And then finally, at the very bottom, looking for that gap between where the skirt meets the neck um, without an excessive gap and also without flaring of the cap at the very bottom. Yeah. All right. And this is good for posterity here. We can... Uh, people can refer back to this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Amanda did already touch on it. And it's, we're kind of beating a dead horse there, so we can skim right past that. All right. Well, thank you all very much for your attention. Um, awesome. Looks like we have some Q and A questions, so that's great. Yeah, we've got about fourteen. Uh, real quick, I just want to. I have a few closing thoughts before we get into the Q and A. Um, you know, some of the takeaways are really important to highlight. You know, it is beating that dead horse, but that horse is important. Um, Obtain a bottle drawing, review it, um, and test it, you know, prior to actually trying to run it, you know, uh, at, at scale and, and with wine in the tank and with people, you know, standing on the line that you're paying uh, per hour, right? So, uh, and also try to do it at speed uh, because uh, when you when you run slow, oh, everything looks great. But if you run it at speed, the problems will tend to show up. And I... Eric, I don't know how you feel about this, but I generally would, would recommend filling bottles with water and have them, you know, run on the line. So you're as, as closely as, as you can mimicking uh, bottling day conditions. Yep. Um, yeah. So, and, and proper quality control while tedious can prevent catastrophes. Um, have, you know, the basic tools on hand to make adjustments uh, and, and, and measurements uh, and liner choice. Um, I say call me, we'll talk about it because that's like one of my favorite topics. Um, also obtain a copy of Taming the Screw. Uh, I think that's really important. We, we mentioned that uh, earlier. And then again, total package oxygen is the dissolved oxygen plus the bottling day pickup and that directly affects your shelf life, directly. Um, and you know, I said basic tools. Here's a picture of a very, very expensive tool specifically for bottling uh, screw cap wines at uh, what sort of scale would you say somebody would have had this, Eric? Um, out of the 1,500 or so that I'm supporting, probably a half dozen have them. Yeah. Uh, we have one, obviously, because bottles are so critical to successful screw capping. We look at a lot of glass, and I, I hate to say I've learned way more about glass <laughs> working for a screw cap company than I ever thought I would. Um, but it is, you know, it's a critical part of the puzzle. Uh, if you look at the, the bottle, the screw cap and the setup of the capping machine and just the function of a capping machine, we by far have the easiest third of that trifecta, but at the same t time, everything that goes right or wrong with a screw cap, whether it's a phys visual defect or a mechanical, you know, the way the cap is working, people assume they have a cap issue or well, the cap's not doing something it's not it's supposed to do it's got to be a cap issue um so yeah. we, we are kind of forced to know a lot about all three pieces of that puzzle right right awesome okay well you know if if people need to go i, I i'm sorry for running over a couple minutes uh we're gonna stay on for as long as uh, you two can uh, and we'll we've got about 15 questions um, and I'm going to try to go through and answer those to the best of my ability. Uh, please talk about the differences in bottles, Stelvin, ROPP, screw cap. I, I'm assuming we're talking uh, torque on tamper evident, roll on pilper proof, you know, the different types of screw caps we see in, in the market. Um, Eric, do you want to briefly address that? 
Sure. Uh, in Taming the Screw, they actually do a good job of tackling that question with the nomenclature. So technically a 30 by 60 is a ROTE, not a ROPP. A ROPP is a 30 by 21 screw cap that is meant to be used on a completely different finish and a completely different application than what we're talking about here. But people sometimes do refer to any screw cap on a wine bottle as ROPP. So technically they're using the wrong nomenclature if you really want to get into it. Right. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask for more clarity. If somebody just says ROP to me, ROPP to me, I'm going to say, what size are we talking about? What, what kind of application are we talking about? So to answer your question in a roundabout way, yes, there is a difference or there can be a difference, but it depends on, you, you really need more detail. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a more of a winemaking question and I don't want to get too far down the rabbit's hole in this because it starts dealing with volatile sulfur chemistry and sometimes winemaking philosophy. Uh, but, Amanda, um, we have someone that's curious about your take on minimal use of copper at any stage of the winemaking process, pre-bottling under screw cap. Uh, so it's not sure exactly what the question is, but do you have a do you have a thought process there or yeah, a philosophy? Well there, of course, there's a maximum amount of copper that you're allowed to add over the course of the wine's life, and um, I, I think I know that number, but I'm not going to say it off the top of my head. Um, but you really obviously want to keep under that uh, parts per million. Um, what I do is, of course, I'll run trials every time we want to add copper and say, I like the 0.4 ppm copper addition. Well, actually, I'll back it off and maybe add only 0.3 ppm to the actual tank because when we're talking about um, doing trials at small levels, there's so much room for error. So, and then we'll assess the copper we added into the tank, if it smells better, and if not, then we can always go back and adjust a little more. But I think the less you can use, the better. And if you're having to use it all the time with all your wines, then I think that signals a problem with something going on in fermentation. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So there is a legal limit of, of residual uh, yes, copper. Residual. And the other issue that can come out of that, um, you know, all, apart from your winemaking philosophy is also copper is an extraordinarily strong oxidative catalyst. So if you want to talk about uh, making a wine to have short shelf life, leave a lot of residual copper in it. Um, so, and there's ways to mitigate that. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit more. Yeast holes are a great way to uh, help reduce the, the residual copper limit. Um, and, and also there's, you don't have to go straight to copper. There are other tools like uh, tannins and uh, something like our, our Regulus um, that, that can help take care of some of those volatile sulfur compound issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I would be curious about your take on, okay, that, we did that one, let's see. What about recyclability? Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on recyclability, Eric? Uh, aluminum is the most widely recycled metal on the planet. Um, so that's a good thing, however, I think there, especially in the United States, there's a misconception uh, with our single stream blue cans. And it depends on where you live. Um, most people assume that if they put a recyclable material into that blue can, that it will be recycled. Realistically, what happens if your recycling center that's taking that waste doesn't have the proper equipment to separate glass, metal from glass, um, it's an eddy current generator. They're expensive. They're not that common. And the value of the glass is not horribly valuable. So it, it's kind of a hard for uh, return on investment for recycling people to, to buy the equipment to go after a commodity that's relatively worthless. Um, so they're just not that common. But the, the technology is out there. Uh, the best way to make sure that your wine bottles are being recycled is to take them to a recycling center that has the separate bins for different colored glass. If you do that, it's going to be crushed. It's going to be returned back into the recycling stream and it will be recycled. But if you put it in the blue can, it may or may not be, and chances are it won't be. Yeah. So a lot of it depends just on the infrastructure of your recycling. Yeah. 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 Same. Okay. Um, what DO levels do you see post bottling? Let's say one week post bottling, Amanda. Yeah, uh, we see, say, for instance, on whites, you know, we'll start out at, you know, 0.5 or below, and it is below 0.5. <laughs> so yes. I'm not seeing any increase because we're really 
managing our pickup on the line as well. And we've got that good, um, that good bottle filler too, that helps sparge a lot of that DO and having the nitrogen inline nitrogen drip helps immensely yeah. with that DO. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's, it's really a combination of, are you flushing your lines with inert gas prior to starting? What sort of filler do you have? What brand? How is the, the, the filler valve designed? You know, it does it flush once, does it flush twice? Does it pull a vacuum? I mean, there's, you know, do are you have leaking? a, are they leaking? Yeah. Right. Um, you know, a, a lot of things, but when you're doing it right, I, I've, I've historically seen um, total package oxygen downstream uh, less than one part per million, uh, thereby the, the, the SO2 depletion post bottling is um, uh, usually less than five parts per million. And that it stays that way. I mean, for a long, long, long time, it's a very, very low uh, gradual uh, decline of, of SO2. So if, Regardless of the closure used, if you want to back calculate what sort of oxygen pickup you have, AKA how, um, how much bottle shock you have, measure your post bottling uh, free SO2 after about a month. And that'll be a relatively correlated. Um, mm -hmm. Four parts per million free SO2 depletion is correlated to about a part per million dissolved oxygen pickup. Okay. Um, there's a couple of people that um, have our smaller wineries and they're sparging with nitrogen manually. Um, they've been talking about, we were talking about screw caps, but um, is there a really good bench top type of screw capper to use? And uh, what's the best way to get rid of uh, the head space and the oxygen? Um, yeah. yeah, there, there are many uh, bench top versions out there, but realistically, I mean, even though that you could cycle them very fast, uh, the handling of putting a wine onto a pedestal, putting a cap on it, cycling the machine, taking the bottle off, doing that over and over again, the chance of you doing more than about six bottles per minute would be pretty rare. I mean, you'd have to really hustle and maybe have three people staging and you know really helping out to run bottles through a single head capper. I've done small bottlings before offline where we were using the filler online to fill bottles running them past a liquid nitrogen doser and, and setting a screw cap over the top of the bottle so that once the liquid nitrogen continued or was done expanding, the cap sits down on the ceiling surface and we assume create would create a seal and stop oxygen from being, being able to get in there. And uh, it worked just fine. Um, even though the, bottle, the capping part of the process was very slow. I mean, it took us all day to do 200 cases, but we were able to do it. Um, there are many, many different brands of cappers out there. I would suggest uh, if you were going to go that route um, to get one of the well-known brands so that if you do grow up into buying a capper that goes in line, um, that you can use that capper that you already have for offline testing and doing these pre-bottling tests or, or dry goods checks. Um, so so if, if the person that makes that bench top type screw capper also makes like a three head or a four head that you would eventually scale up to keeping in that exactly. same brand and having the back end support and parts compatibility and yeah. redundancy is uh, what you recommend. And that's going to vary by area. You know, there's sure. different uh, distributors that are supporting different areas around the United States. Um, but it's, it's a really good thing, especially if you're into big production to have an offline capper for doing offline testing. And if that capper is compatible with the capper on the line, it's very nice to have a way to run. Let's say you're having an issue with one capping head. You can swap, swap out it. the heads, yeah. go work offline while the line runs, figure out what the issue is and have that line, have that head ready to go as soon as you have an opportunity to switch it back. So right. those kind of things can really, really help you with your productivity. And it's something that I don't think a lot of people think about when they're, when they're thinking about offline testing. Uh, also, I'll, I'll take this. We still have 70 people um, online down from a, uh, a little bit, but if you guys want to hop off and um, send in questions, info at scottlab.com uh, is, is a great way to do it, or just call the office and it'll, we'll, we'll handle it from there. Um, that way, you know, if you got to go, you got to go. We understand. Um, so the, the second part of that question was, what's the best way to rid oxygen in the headspace? Well, I think primarily it would be some sort of liquid nitrogen. Uh, if you, and if you're on the micro scale, I understand that that's it's not going to be an option. So a little bottle of argon, I think is probably the direction that I would go. 
Also, I, I do have some small, small customers that they choose a liner like the Sarin 10 liner instead of Sarin X, knowing that they're not going to treat headspace. Yeah. And that can help a little bit. But I, I think, I really do think, I think we discussed this the other day that headspace DO, and, or, well, DO and headspace oxygen probably equate to more oxygen in the total bottle package than the, the OTR choice of the liner. Yeah, I agree. Um, a lot of this is about dissolved oxygen and stuff, but uh, the hockey industry uses screw caps with less material remaining on the uh, on the bottle after opening the skirt. Right? There's no skirt. It's just a it's just a tuck under. Um, yeah, for the most part. Yeah. So it seems like wine skirt caps leave a skirt just to copy the foil of the cork finished bottle. That's correct. It's unfortunate that extra material is consumed to mimic tradition when screw caps could continue to make new traditions. This is. Um, uh, an interesting point, but are there technical differences between the Saki screw caps and wine screw caps, specifically liner? Things yeah, like there, there are. Um, there's a couple things that are different and a lot of people don't realize that the glass finish for a short skirt cap, like the one used on a Saki bottle of 30 by 21, um, the, the, that finish was designed for alcohol and other products that, that aren't sensitive to oxidation. So there's no room for a redraw on the top. So those, those caps are applied by pushing straight down on the top. You're only getting a top seal. So it's not the ideal finish for a wine. It can be done. There are people that uh, do it anyway. Like uh, there's a Gallo bottle out there I've seen quite a bit that has a 30 by 21 finish and cap on a wine product. Um, shelf life, I would imagine, would, would be diminished. And it's just not the norm, but yeah. it can be done. It's kind of one of those situations where, like, can it be done? Yes, but there's a reason why almost nobody does it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other thing about a long skirt cap is not only does it give you those design options, but it, it conceals the headspace that right. people, you know, clue in on. If you see all that headspace uh, because there's no cork filling that normal where normal area where the cork would be, the bottles kind of look like an underfill. Yeah. And so people not knowing that there's actually regulated volume might steer away from that bottle thinking that it's underfilled. Right. So that actually dovetails into another question um, was what, what would be the harm of increasing fill height in order to decrease O2 in the headspace? Uh, that's if you don't have any nitrogen gas versus flush yeah. or something like that. that. That's a very good question. And, and I'm glad that, that it came up because um, headspace volume in a screw cap bottle is critical uh, because of thermal expansion of the wine as it goes out into the world. So typically wine bottles are filled around 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you don't have that, that gas headspace above the wine, as the liquid expands from thermal expansion, that creates pressure under the screw cap. If the headspace is too small or the bottle is overfilled, that pressure spikes much faster and much higher and your chances of having leakage goes up exponentially okay um let's dismiss that one um who sells torque testing equipment i believe that was was it an imada or yamada that was shown in this presentation Yamada, it looks like that yeah Look. but there's um there's quite a few different many, many, many. Manu yeah many manufacturers so let's just let's just uh punt on that one and if you have questions follow up afterwards and we can send you a couple links but it's uh, they're they're used in all sorts of applications so they're very common um, this is an interesting question. It's a good one. How does different slip agents in the cap affect the torque and can it affect the seal pressure? I'm not sure exactly what they mean, but I think maybe, um, slip agents, like maybe potentially water or wine on the top of the bottle, maybe causing torque issues. Uh, Luke, if you look at the inside of the screw cap, it has what looks kind of like a gold anodizing on it. Okay. That, that coating does have a slip agent in it. Gotcha. And the reason it's there for is twofold. One, it helps us um, during the drawing process or stretching the cap from a flat sheet into a cylindrical shape. Uh, without it, the aluminum would blow apart. Um, but we, we can order that internal varnish with more or less slip agent. Our goal is to have a cap that's easy to open. Um, there is actually no upside to having a cap that's hard to open. Um, it might give somebody more secure feeling, but realistically, um, there's there's no effect on uh, how well it holds onto the glass, but it does affect how it slides across the glass when you're twisting it open. So, so yes, there is an effect. We really only use one, and ours is proprietary, and it happens to have 
to be slipperier than some of our competitors. Okay. Um, let's see here. What's the best and safest way to remove the skirt of the cat from the bottle? I think we might uh, punt on that one. Just yeah. be careful. Yeah. There, 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 there are pros to con pros and cons of reusing glass. Um, you know, if there, if it's already been ran through the capper once it can be damaged. So without very close inspection, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I want to get into it. We, yeah. we, we use a piece of equipment to do it for testing um, that, that has a foot pedal, so there's no hand knives involved. But there are also techniques that I've seen used by many, many people using a utility knife. But, you know, anytime you have a sharp blade in your hand and yeah. there, there's risks involved. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question was I have a, uh, about dissolved oxygen. I understand the need to check DO throughout the lifestyle life cycle of the wine to prevent reduction. How do you counter this with the requirement of oxygen nutrition during a successful fermentation, specifically the addition of Bermate O? Um, so that's a pretty complicated topic, and it has to do with the fact that yeast do use oxygen in their uh, life cycle. And this is one of the reasons why during punch downs and pump overs, we're adding air. There's things like pneumatage, uh, Fermade O, for example, and some other uh, organic nutrition actually has a couple of units of oxygen built into it. Um, so it, when, when we're talking dissolved oxygen and, and prevention and remediation and things like that, during fermentation and, and yeast fit feeding is a whole different situation than post fermentation. And I'm being very specific with my words, post primary fermentation. Um, so yeah, I think that pretty well covers it. We can feel free to reach out for me. We can talk a little bit further about that. Um, somebody uses CO2 and I'm assuming CO2 gas for headspace management of the bottles. Um, one of you want to handle that one on like, what are the pros and cons? Uh, the pros can be the creating excessive pressure in the headspace that shouldn't be there and a higher likelihood of leakage. Um, I, I, I don't know anybody doing it personally. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why you would. They used to call it, I think snow dropping or snow capping, I think is what they call it. But um, from an inert gas standpoint, remember that CO2 is highly soluble. So you, you can get those changes in internal bottle pressure and potentially leaking. And it, it's, it's a generally not the recommended uh, gas to use, uh, it, it, argon or nitrogen, due yeah. to their low solubility. And if right. you've got a still wine, and if you're, I don't know, adding too much, that could change the yeah. mouthfeel perception. Okay, two more. What's the proper way to increase or decrease opening torque? That's a big question. Uh, it depends on which torque you're talking about and why it's high or low in the first place. Um, best case scenario is you've done your homework, you, you've verified your top load or your vertical pressure. So you know that when your capper's at running height, that it's applying 160 kilos of top load to the, the bottle under it. That's the spec is 160 kilos plus or minus 20 for 30, 30 by 60 screw cap. Um, so hopefully you've done that. You've verified that your side pressures are in the spec, uh, seven to 14 kilos in the working position. Um, if you've done those things and let's say, um, Amanda mentioned earlier, her range for torques, which I, I don't necessarily, uh, those aren't what we prescribe, uh, the range dictated by SETI in Europe, which is like a committee that provides specs for screw capping manufacturers, um, are six to 24 inch pounds, which is a huge range. I'm not going to be so concerned about getting sixes or even, you know, in the high twenties, if I know everything else is where it's supposed to be. And there's consistency from head to head. At that point, I know that it's just a material issue causing that. It may be the slipperiness of the internal varnish. It might be a pronounced seam going up the side of the bottle through the threads that the cap is kind of gouging into. It might be, I, I mean, there's so many different things that can cause variations in torque. But what's important is that all the heads are reacting similarly. If you notice that head number one is giving you a drastically different result than all the rest, well, that is is your time to clue in on uh, a variation in a, in a torque because that tells you, hey, something's going on with that head that is different than, than the rest. Um, obviously, that's a little harder to do on a single head capper because 
all the bottles should be reacting the same. So it probably becomes even more important to, to verify all of those other settings to make sure that they're right. Awesome. Um, any other final thoughts, Amanda or Eric? Um, no, not really. Yeah, I don't know if we want to address here. this last question. Uh, the last question is a complicated one about a QC program for dissolved oxygen and on and on. Okay. So um, okay. I will handle that offline. So awesome. Excellent, well, this, guys. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone that's still thank on you. the line. Uh, yeah, awesome. really. All yep. right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.